Good afternoon and welcome to the Overview and Scrutiny Management Committee. Um, can we first of all introduce committee members? Um, so Councillor Marchington, if you'd like to start, please. Yeah, Andrew Marchington, Kirkley's Councillor, Chair of the Children's Scrutiny Panel. Councillor Uppal. Um, hi there, Councillor Uppal, Chair of the Economies and Neighbourhood Scrutiny Panel. Councillor Zaman. I think you're on mute. Good afternoon, Councillor Habiban Zaman, Chair of uh, Health and Scrutiny Adult Social Care Panel. Thank you. And uh, we've had no apologies, so we hope our colleague, Councillor Cooper, uh, will join us soon. And I'm Councillor Liz Mage, Chair of the Overview and Scrutiny Management Committee. Minutes of the previous meeting. The minutes of the previous meeting held on the 9th of June 2020 have been circulated. Uh, do we approve those minutes? Yes. Yes, yes, thank you. And are there any matters arising that any of the committee have from the minutes, please? No. I just have one, uh, page two, item uh, 74. The, um, have a look. The ad hoc scrutiny panel for future arrangements for the council's residential housing stock. Uh, we're looking to hold an informal management committee meeting on the 29th of September uh, to consider a report from that ad hoc committee uh, that has been uh, look, meeting and looking at the consultation that's currently running. Okay, any other matters arising? No, thank you very much. Any interests that any uh, councillors need to declare? No. Thank you. And all the debates this afternoon are held in public. We haven't received any uh, deputations or petitions or any public questions. So we'll move straight on to item seven, uh, which is the item on the council plan. Uh, for this, I believe we've got uh, Rachel Spencer Henschel, Kate McNicholas, and uh, Marcus uh, that are speaking. So, if you could um, speak to the report, please, whichever of you is going to start. And if you can introduce yourselves uh, before you start, that would be lovely. Thank you. Okay, um, if it's all right, um, Chair, I'll just kick us off, um, although Kate and Marcus will take us through the detail. So, um, just wanted to um, sort of introduce the item uh, we've brought today, the proposal around the development of the new corporate plan or our, our council plan, um, along with a um, appendix which covers our draft recovery framework, which we've been working towards. And then Marcus will take us through some of the key communications approaches we've taken through COVID, which has obviously been uh, worked alongside the Outbreak Control Board. Um, I think it's safe to say that obviously we are in a, a different position than we were expecting when we were looking at redoing our corporate plan this year. So hopefully what Kate will outline is our approach that balances the response we've had to undertake due to COVID and how we've managed, we, we hopefully will learn from the lessons of that to develop a council plan um, that recognises where we've been and helps us through the next phases. So I'm going to pass over um, to Kate, who's going to take you through the paper that you've had sight of. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so you recall the last year um, we did the year two update of our 2018 to 2020 council plan. So we gave it a, an update for the second for the second part of that. What we had intended to do was a more substantial and full review um, this year, establishing a three year council plan, corporate plan for um, for the next period. In the context that we're operating now, what we've agreed is that we will instead go for a one year extension to the existing corporate plan um, rather than do a full and, and detailed piece of work at this point of time. In that extension, what we will focus on is the um, consolidation of some of our recover, um, response and recovery work that we've been progressing in, in response to the um, coronavirus pandemic. In, in particular, 
um, what we're keen to do is to play in some of the learning that we've um, made so far about our understanding about the values of the um, organisation, what we've seen, what we've experienced and what we found incredibly positive in terms of our staff and councillor response over, over this, this, are we on five months period, maybe six months, five months. Um, we will do some further work on the values. So what we will do in the council plan this year is play back what we've seen and what and what we've what we're incredibly proud of. Um, we'll do some follow up work next year to really consolidate those values and embed them within the organisation in a way that makes sure that that people really understand the expectations sitting alongside the behaviours that we've already got established. So that's that's one of the newer parts of, of the plan that we intend to focus on. It is worth saying that we will um, be remaining committed to our seven shared outcomes. So the plan will be structured around those as previously. I think the work that we've done so far in our re, um, response and recovery mode has, has shown the importance of, of those outcomes and that they remain you know, valid and, and, and true in terms of things that we should remain focused on. We, we will also um, do a, an update around our commitment around people, partners and place as informing our approach to, to the if, you know, if the outcomes are, I'm sure I said this this time last year, if our, if our outcomes are the what we focus on, then the how we work being informed by people, partners and our place based commitment. So we will do, do a further update again, emphasising our ongoing commitment of, of, around those three areas. The the um, Council plan will, will also aim to um, incorporate some of the recovery framework work and I'll come on to that in just a little moment. But what we will try and do is to make it a bit of a shorter document this year. We're, we're clear that the you know, one of the key purposes of the council plan is, is to help communicate what we're here for and how we work, um, particularly um, staff facing. And you know, in discussion with colleagues in, in communications and, and also in our human um, resources department then we think that a shorter document will, will help land that better, but accompanied by some critical other pieces of work. So we will a, we will be doing some case studies around what, what we've seen in terms of the delivery against our outcomes and our ways of working and our values. We will do a piece of work that um, updates on how we've progressed against the existing corporate plan. So what progress we have made against those existing commitments and also um, with input from our intelligence colleagues, um, where we are in terms of some of the key indicators that help us see how we're doing against our shared outcomes. So while the doc, while the council plan itself will be a, a smaller and sort of lean, leaner document than what we're aiming to do is have that kind of sweet suite of products around it that that sort of um, make a more accessible but but um, yeah more, a more accessible sort of set of of um, material. In terms of the um, flight path that, that we're looking at, we are due um, Councillor Cooper corporate scrutiny um, on the 10th of September. Yep. Um, we're then through to Cabinet on the 22nd of September. And as you'll know, then corporate plan, council plan is a council decision. So we're at full council on the 21st of October. So that's the timescales that, that we're working to in terms of that development. As I said, the council plan will in, will incorporate some of the recovery frame with the work that we've done around our response to the recovery and the recovery framework, which is one of the papers in your pack, sets out. Um, for, for, for me, it sets out two, maybe three critical things. First of all, that understanding of the the phases in which we're we're operating. Um, we. We know that in the immediate days after the you know, the pandemic started to hit, that we were fully in response mode. Um, we know that we have, have been starting to try and recover some services. In actual fact, what we're doing is both those things at once. And the, the recovery framework sets out that, that we, that we, we knew um, you know, even back in June when, when, it, when it was drafted, that our, our recovery would be um, a fluid thing. That it would that those phases would run concurrently, and that we would sometimes move backwards as well as forwards. So you know, it isn't it isn't a pure linear thing, which which, which certainly tested some of our um, graphics colleagues in terms of trying to set out the those phases. But hopefully, the the one pager that you've got that's a summary of the framework is is a, is an indication of how we're trying to sort of structure some of that approach. 
The recovery framework also sets out some, some key principles. And I think the one that of those that I'd like to draw your attention to is, is that commitment around tackling inequalities. So tackling inequalities in, in, in all their forms will be become much more, I mean, it, obviously it was a key part of our corporate plan previously, but it's something that we're aiming to dedicate a greater focus to. So the council plan will, will have um, a, a clearer narrative and clearer commitment of, around that focus and will be accompanied um, along its flight path um, by a tackling inequalities action plan that will set out specifically what we're going to do to address inequalities over the over the next period so from October onwards that inequalities action plan will come to cabinet and council and indeed corporate scrutiny councillor cooper at, at the at the same time as the council plan so we can see and we can share how those two things fit, fit together um I think that that's that that's critical. I think the the other the other aspect that we're aiming to sort of weave together in, in this, so that we're we're creating a bit more of a coherent approach, is the refreshed people strategy as well. So we're looking to make sure that the given the sort of staff facing nature of of, of the council plan, making sure that that's um, woven together with our our refreshed people strategy, led out by Deborah Lucas. I think that's probably what I'd like to outline at the moment. Marcus, can I hand to you? Obviously, the recovery framework has provided a guide to some of our um, communications over the last five months, but I think you were going to outline a little bit more about sort of what's informed some of that. And the um, report that you've got in front of you sets out a little further in, in a little further detail some of your, your overall approach to communication. Yep, thanks, Kate. Um, I'm Marcus Bowell. I'm um, Head of Strategic Communications. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what our approach has been to communications during the um, pandemic. A little bit is in the report, but I'll, I'll flesh that out um, now for you. Um, when the pandemic started, um, we realised that we would um, need a bit of a new approach to the communications um, from the council. We're, we were essentially in a, a long running crisis communication situation and we thought we needed um, a different approach for our for our resources and our, our content and our messages. So we we set ourselves four themes that are outlined um, in the paper. And the purpose of setting those those themes was to try and make sure that we could be as proactive as we could be um, in a crisis. It's easy to get bounced around by by events and be in, in constant um, reaction mode. Um, so we wanted to, to be proactive um, present the council in, in the best possible um, light and get the right information out to people because um, getting that information out is, is clearly essential in a, in a public health emergency. And th those four headings um, were essentially to be a, a guiding council. And that, that's the focus of that was getting the, the public health advice and the restrictions out there um, to people at the, at the right time and make that um, reliable and, and credible. And the second theme was to um, communicate as a, an enabling council. So we needed to help um, use our communications to unlock some of the community capacity out there, um, how people could volunteer, how people could get help if they needed it um, above and beyond um, core services. And we also wanted to highlight the the kind of good news stories, the kind of community spirit that was that was really evident, especially at the, the early stages of the crisis. And we thought we could support doing that um, and the third theme was um, the delivering council we wanted to uh, signpost and inform people to to things where where life was continuing as normal or advise people about how they could interact with the council um, uh, in different ways because of the um, because of the the, the crisis, um, things like services that have moved online or services that were carrying on, but perhaps in a slightly different way. But we wanted people to be assured that the council was was still um, delivering. And the the fourth but critical um, theme was was the council as an employer. We needed to keep staff informed, especially in the 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 early days about when their working patterns and and their um, and their responsibilities might have changed, but we, we, we've tried to keep them supported and motivated um, throughout. So 
we've organized our our planning um and our content and our channels um under those four themes over the last um few months it's kind of how we've planned and prioritized um our work over the months so we've kind of moved into newer phases um of the crisis and th there's a couple of things probably to point out that are more more recent developments to our work and and one of the things is is we've we've added kind of openness about things like the data that we that we get um about the numbers about outbreaks um especially workplace outbreaks um and we've tried to explain um changing guidance in in as clear a fashion um as we can and, and more recently um than that um we've supported the community protection plan work so that's brought a, a new um a new set of challenges for us that's much more about targeting communications um both geographically and to to groups in the community about identifying very specific barriers that people might have in, in um in getting testing or or adhering to the public health guidance so um that's been a, a new and different um phase of our work but we're we're supporting that um as best we can and then finally i'll just say we're in the early stages of building a new communication strategy and this sort of is where um our work links in with what what kate um has just described um we need a new communication strategy um and we're just starting our our engagement with um internally with and we're going to be doing more work with with other services and people outside the council um and members um so that we can align what we're doing more closely with the the corporate view and with with the council plan and um, because we think it will be more more effective um that way so that's a, a kind of rundown, a very brief rundown of, of how communications has worked over the last few months. And I'm uh, happy to take questions. OK, thank you very much. Um, if members will use the raise hands function on the software, please, uh, to indicate they wish to ask questions. Councillor Cooper, you've indicated already. Um, yeah, uh, so so thanks for, for that. Um, I, I was looking through the, um, uh, the, the papers at uh, uh, the, the four areas that we're looking at in terms of um, COVID response. And, and the last one is, is uh, and I'm I've heard it previously and I'm surprised it survived, it is this heading of Forever Kirklees. Now, um, it, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a hard comms plan it's a hard comms push that i think uh, to have forever kirklees as some sort of um, thing that everybody's going to come around and go yeah forever kirklees because kirklees is not a loved institution it's not a real place uh, and you know if we're if we're into place based working it's not a place it's if 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 places a, a feeling of place is important to us then Forever Kirklees is is if that's going to get outside the organisation, then it, it basically shouldn't uh, effectively. We should dump it and we should trash it and we should trash it now and find a better name for it, really. Uh, and um, otherwise, you just got a hostage to fortune there. Um, other things uh, looking along and, and looking at some of the phases that we can look at with this, there's there's all this um, reference to in recovery that growth is what we ought to be looking for. But I actually think resilience is probably the thing at times of crisis that we ought to be trying to pursue more resilient economies, more resilient organizations, organizations that can weather all sorts of different storms, be those pandemics, climate crises, uh, anything that uh, the world can throw at us. So if we're looking for a, a role for the organization going forward then resilience it, is it um looking uh, elsewhere in the report climate change we're always pleased to see uh, a good mention of climate change there but so far there's very little to look at in terms of things the council is doing to address climate change now i know that change within the organization is coming i know that there are opportunities out there i've placed a few uh, in front of people's eyes myself um, to try and see if those will result in anything. So I'll I'll hold hold my fire and my ire um, for for the moment. Um, I would like to mention about um, making use of 
uh, money for cyclists. Um, uh, there's the money that was made available by government for cyclists. I, I don't know if we've necessarily made the best use of it because things we've done of them being backtracked upon. I, I, I think the sort of things that we ought to be looking for and the sort of things that cyclists are looking for is is greenways, is safe spaces, is places where they, they, they really can for uh, in, a, in the long term have a uh, have sp safe spaces to cycle so places like the home valley greenway uh, which is um, pretty much a community-led campaign the fenny greenway which is rearing its head again thank goodness um, uh, as as something that people want to look at so these sort of things are the things we ought to be uh, pursuing not not short-term road closures not short-term um, short term fixes, which um, really end up with huge problems. Thank you. Does anybody want to come back on any of those points, Rachel? Yeah, um, um, just to give some reassurance to Councillor Cooper, um, certainly what's in that recovery framework is very much a kind of a document about what the strategy is and the and the kind of approach, how that would be communicated into um, messages out to the public would obviously um, be mindful of what may or may not um, be meaningful to them. And certainly we're learning all the time the feedback about kind of how people view their place, whether that be Kirklees or whether that be smaller towns and villages. And I think that reinforces, if anything, the approach of, for place-based working and how right. people value where they live. Right, Rachel, I don't want to, uh, sorry to interrupt, uh, but this is a public document. This is uh, this has gone out uh, on the on the website. Um, it's a public document. It, it, it's out there, uh, and so it, it's not something that we can you know, sit around a desk and look at. This is something that's uh, that's that's part of what people can you know what a reporter could see if they if they decided to look at it and, and decided to make an issue of it. I suppose all I meant was there are many documents that the council produces that are technical, detailed, that would be in the public domain as a public document. But actually, if we were then going to do some communications that would ask people to do something differently or to engage people, then we might take a different approach. Um, okay. I just want to support your comment about resilience. I couldn't agree more. I think that resilience in terms of personal resilience, community resilience, organisational resilience are all absolutely critical going forward. So I think we can make that stronger in the report. So that's really helpful feedback. Thank you. I would just substitute growth, for resilience for growth. That That's the easiest, I think. It refocuses the organisation on what it's about. OK, thank you. Councillor Marchington <laughs> and then Councillor Opal. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, just focusing on the um, areas around improving outcomes for children uh, with this uh, fascinating uh, what's happening today and happened last week around educational outcomes. I'll come back to that in a minute. I think just looking if about the, the opportunities um, at the moment as things are changing rapidly. And I think one of the things we could look at that has been picked up is about um, food vouchers, for, for children on uh, young people whose, whose families are on free school meals and that sort of system uh, real push to keep that going throughout the summer and perhaps there is a bit of an opportunity to actually look at the impact of the, the, the vouchers on on parents and families I mean some of the anecdotal stuff we've picked up locally is having you know depending on how many children you have you know, having 15 pounds 30 pounds 45 pounds extra income to spend on food has been has made quite a significant impact on family budgets and keeping that going and looking at how that can do that and also the contributions that schools have made in terms of looking at that so um so again it's looking at opportunities within the plan fitting it in connectivity quite clear one of the things we needed to be looking at is with children learning from home and family supporting that were were families connected? Did they have access to 4G or access to broadband? Uh, did they have the kit that they could access online lessons on? And yes, we've used that during the crisis, but actually that'd be a really good thing if we can keep doing that in the forward plan, seeing that as an opportunity uh, to do that. Uh, one of the key things we've got in children's scrutiny is educational outcomes. And it's just fascinating how as a whole country we're, we're looking at uh, standardisation of 
uh, exam results and a better understanding of of what that and uh, and, and actually it's amazing how at a stroke that uh, we can improve educational outcomes academic outcomes for children overnight there's been a 10 percent increase in um, in higher grades um, with, with the new policy and um, we've got to uh, increase numbers of passes as you know class grades four and above but um, actually a bit of scrutiny of how those grades and how the grades are allocated and the impact on particular children and young people in Kirklees who we might describe some of whom has been more disadvantaged and, and the disparities we can shine a spotlight on that during this this recovery period to to look at what we can get but how we can get better outcomes for our young people i know scrutiny is up for a longer term you know it's not just what's happened last week and this week in terms of educational outcome what's going to be impact this september on on college children going to children young people going to college what's going to be impact next year on places what's going to be impact on universities our own university uh, of huddersfield and young children young people going to elsewhere and we need a, a plan for tracking that over the longer term and I think the other thing, again, I'm just focusing on children and young people, but uh, it links in with the economic strategy, uh, that really good link we've had with employers about um, support during during lockdown, during the current pandemic. Uh, can we use the better links we've developed to make sure that the um, that children and young people can, can, can be going into appropriate employment locally, uh, not all just going to go away to not so I'm just thinking about going to university or going to college actually you can do the combination of both both hiring further education how it links to employment making those links so I think there are opportunities there with the plan uh, to do that and it, this is all linked back to what it's saying about I mean the best outcomes the best start in life for our children and young people but those best starts might happen at various times at uh, different times in their lives thank you Who wishes to respond on that? I'm happy to, if that's OK. Yeah, OK. OK. Um, I think the point that, that you make, Councillor Marchington, around um, digital inclusion is a, is a really helpful one. Obviously, there's been a lot of work that's been done over the last few months, helping both in terms of kits, but also then building in that recognition that it's also about um, data access and it's also about skills. I think that we're clear that there is a, there's more to do to understand you know, who is digitally excluded and, and, and why and then what can we do about that. And there's a really strong partnership commitment to working with, for instance, the college and the university around addressing um, digital exclusion. So, um, and and focusing in on well, what difference can we make, particularly for young people with the college and the university, obviously, but then more broadly as well, working with libraries. So I, I would expect that that sort of focus on digital inclusion is likely to be a strong part of that inequalities action plan that I mentioned, you know, and a key part of the delivery of the council plan moving forward. I think it's you know, become, it was a recognised issue previously, but it's become much more clear in terms of the impact it's had on, on lives over the last few months. Um, I, I, I'm not sure whether I assume that you keyed into the work of the um, Education and Learning Partnership Board who, when you were talking about some of the things that, you know, the, there's a need to focus on in terms of educational outcomes and the disparity across them, or, or indeed the kind of connections through to sort of the economic agenda, it, re it really chimed with me with something that I saw recently um, from, from that learning, Education Learning Partnership Board about some of their sort of priorities that they've developed in, um, I think, over the last sort of month or so for the next academic year for sort of the, the the, the living with and, and through through COVID. I know that they've certainly had a, a much stronger um, relationship with some of our colleagues in, in economic development, looking, you know, for instance, at the, the impact in terms of um, childcare provision and people's ability to work, but then also looking more broadly. So I think I think there's, there's certainly work going on in, in that area, but I'm sure that, 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 you're, that you're keyed into that as well. Councillor Marching, do you want to come back at all? No, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ruppal. Yeah, Councillor Ruppal. Yeah. Um, sorry. Thank you, Chair. That's um, uh, th thanks for bringing me in. Just firstly, thank you for the work that you've done on the on the uh, on the council plan. I know they're not always easy to put 
put these uh, documents together. Um, and also just on the communications, uh, thanks, Mark, as for what you said. I do think um, communications has improved over uh, the last months or so. I've actually quite, um, I've been grateful for the uh, the internal comms uh, emails that we've got through. I think those have, have been uh, quite helpful. And I think actually if we look at some of the web posts that have gone up, actually the way um, that's presented to the public, it's quite easy to understand and I think if we just make sure we, we are using that going forward I think you know it's, it's definitely um, some learning there so so thank you for that um, again I think the only thing I would say was just um, and I'm, I'm glad to see you've put some more information out to people about um, about COVID data uh, and where they can access it um, I think that's that that's been good I think for some people it's just you know, I, definitely there's been some tensions, I think, in, in the local area, not tensions, but some concerns about people not necessarily knowing uh, uh, where out, out where con areas of concern are or where outbreaks are. So you've you've, you've shared that information, which, which is good. Thank you for that. Um, I really welcome the um, the priority on tackling inequalities. I think that's absolutely key. I think definitely something that I've been um, talking about for some time. I just, just in terms of the document, I think it does get lost a little bit. Um, so at the you've got your mission, and then in your principles, you've got sort of tackling inequalities as a bullet point, sort of third way down. Um, and for me, I think if we're saying this is the key thing, it's just got to stand out in absolutely every document that we put out, and also in in everything we say. So. I, d I don't know how you would do it, but I would want that to be higher up on, <laughs> on everything. And really that focus on tackling inequalities then has to feed into absolutely everything we do. Um, the only thing I would say is that previously, like with some of the work around the inclusive economy and local wealth building, that's something that personally I uh, have, a, have a real interest in. But if I then ask colleagues who are perhaps outside of some of the economic teams, they don't really understand it. Um, and it's not necessarily feeding into all all our different programs so I would definitely like to see that when we're talking about uh, tackling inequalities people understand what that is and how it feeds into because it, it's got to feed in absolutely every single program that we do and there's some structure around that for our for our officer colleagues but also council colleagues so they understand what that means um, and just on the stuff around infrastructure um, I think you've, you've made clear here that you perhaps have to look differently at some of those infrastructure projects post COVID. Um, and I think it is important that we, we look again at that and, and in terms of chiming it in with um, the priorities that we've put in on climate change. Um, and also when we're talking about infrastructure within that, we must talk about social capital. I think that side gets left out a lot. The infrastructure stays in because we can see it. We can you know we can see the the impacts of it but we can't always see um social capital um and I'd, I'd like to see a bit more emphasis on that and just the point that um andrew made on on the greenways i think that's really key i mean uh, you know as a ward council that's something i want to focus on in my ward it's quite a deprived area uh we're not that far from town we've got greenways and we've got the canals uh, but at the moment they're not clean they're not clean and they're not safe so a lot of people don't use them um, so again, I think looking at those sort of longer term projects rather than perhaps just shutting a street for two days, um, you know, I'd like to see more sort of uh, focus on that as well. I think that's it from, oh, just one more thing. I'm sorry, guys, but just this table thing where you put, you can't see it, but you know, the table where it's a response adaptation, Forever Kirklees. I mean, I agree with the point of Forever Kirklees. I'm not, uh, it's, it sounds like a, a soap drama, if I'm being honest. Um, and then I quite didn't quite understand the bits where you've put state of mind under each section as well. And I'm not sure, you know, what what is what is that telling me? I guess you're saying that's the state of mind people are at, at that level. Of COVID, but sometimes when we talk about sort of some documents, which some of the wording sounds a bit funny, I think so. You know, that that's one of those ones where I just be like, it's, 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 I don't really know why that's why that's there, really. So, so that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I I, I would agree on the forever Kirkley. It just doesn't just doesn't make any um, uh, sense that. But uh, and I also had a point as well about the inequalities. Uh, being uh, more front and center having it the third bullet down i can understand why you've got the safety first but having inequalities 
the third bullet down it didn't seem to it seemed to be counterintuitive with what you were saying you were needed but Kate you've indicated you want to come in on this Kate yeah no that that's that's a really helpful stir thank you both um the the council plan will put inequalities front front and center so while the recovery framework which is about our response to to, to covid is, as you say councillor smide need, need, you know needs that emphasis on on safety as its starting point then the, the council plan will provide that clear upfront commitment around tackling inequality in all, in all its forms the the inequalities action plan that will sit alongside it will then say and here's what we're going to do so the the council plan will provide that that sort of language that you would expect and that clarity of, of mission and purpose the action plan then will set out you know the key things that we will do in the first instance not in the first instance because it's not the been that we've not been been working to tackle inequalities already but in in the first phase of, of that action plan so it will then provide that commitment around the, the you know what do we do about it as well as that kind of you've know, been able to articulate the centrality of, of, of that work and yeah. um, the the the, the point that you made around inclusive economy and, and how that fits in, um, I think, was, was, was a really helpful one as well. I was thinking about it when Councillor Cooper was talking about growth versus resilience previously. I mean, that that commitment around um, building an inclusive economy, which is part of, of the recovery framework, then sits uh, you know, as a key aspect of our economic recovery plan, which I know will, you know, you'll be, be really familiar with. And one of the things that we that we will do is make sure some of those really strong commitments around in, an inclusive economy uh, are reflected out into that wider tackling inequalities action plan, in part for, as you say, because then those commitments do need to run across the organisation and across what we do with partners as well. So that the, effectively the economic recovery plan and the inequalities action plan need to in intersect around those key points because there's some really strong commitments in the economic recovery plan. You know, there's things that we're that we're working on there around inclusive economy that we you know that we should be really proud of and need to make sure that they they, they land effectively and, and are focused on, you know that that kind of economic resilience rather than the, the the growth at all costs that I know would be be of a concern to, to councillors. Yeah. Um, in, in terms of your last point ar around state of mind, I mean, I'd, I'd sort of repeat what, what Rachel said, you know, that while these documents are, as, as you said, in, in the public domain, that they're, they're not designed as our sort of key communication tools. It's not that we're going to suddenly turn them into posters and expect that that will, will do the things that we need to do. The, the, the state of mind aspect on that, on that, the, on the two sided that you referred to, as, as you say, is is about well, what what are we trying to understand in terms of what's in people's minds at at, at, at those various points in time, you know, really so that we're we're trying to work with the grain of, of where people are and where and where we are as an organization rather than you know, thinking that it can all be data driven or it can be all, all be you know running at a million miles an hour so that that was the kind of the the reason for including that but obviously if, if it was something if i mean marcus may want to um input at this point but if it was something where we would be wanting to to play that out more overtly then it, it wouldn't be done in such a um it'd be done in a much more subtle way Marcus um I think there's there would be a lot of comms development work to do before we found the 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 right wording the I think it's more more about the the concepts at the moment rather than how we necessarily describe them I'd I'd like to talk to wider groups of people before we before we settled on anything yeah, I uh, sorry, Chair. Can I just come back? Or is, is that all right? Yeah, yeah, I, I I agree. And obviously, I know you wouldn't put this out to the public or whatever and say, look, this is what we're trying to tell you about acceptance in terms of your state of mind <laughs> and that. Um, I, I I totally get that. I think it's just worth us all having a, a think about the language we use. Just generally, not just yourselves. I me, I do it all the time myself, and I don't realise sometimes I'm t talking in a certain type of speak and. You know, my colleagues sometimes have to pull me up and say, look, ah, people aren't going to understand what that means. So I think if we're just in that frame of mind, it's worth us, uh, worth us uh, thinking that and perhaps not thinking of, well, actually, this is just internal. So we'll speak like this and this one's external. We'll do it like that. I think if we had one way of sort of communicating, it might be better. And I, I do love the stuff, actually, that you put in the internal comms bulletin and in, in on the website, because I just think it's very clear and uh, for us to to understand. Um, oh, sorry, and just one more point, Kate. In terms of that, what metrics will you be using for the inequalities plan? Because inequalities is so big, it's huge. So I assume you're going to have some 
manageable things that might be about trying to manage your diabetes rates, um, you know, looking at your training programs, but then your, your bigger ones like trying to reduce the life expectancy gap, trying to reduce the skills gap, it just be understanding how, how, how you've put that together. Am I all right to come back on that chair? Yes, that's fine. Thank you, Rachel. Um, yeah, I totally agree, Harpreet, in terms of intelligence. So I think um, what we've done is we've looked at what are the key indicators at population level of inequality. So that would be things like healthy life expectancy and the things that you probably are only going to measure on an annual basis, um, probably no more frequently than that, but that would give us a, an indication of whether our um, population was moving in the right direction in terms of tackling inequality. Because if you look at just life expectancy without looking at healthy life expectancy, obviously you don't necessarily get those inequality. But what we'd also be expecting in the plan is to look at access as well. So as well as inequality of outcome, we need to understand the impact we're having on any on access. So that might be, for example, looking at things like the programmes we commission for, um, I don't know, NHS Health Checks is probably a really good example where we'd want to be really, really clear about how that was proactively targeting the groups that we know um, struggle in terms of access to good treatment for some of those conditions and that they're, they're often diagnosed at a late stage. So that suite of measures would be both um, sort of access and more shorter term as well as long term and population level so that we can understand as a borough um, whether we're actually shifting and reducing that gap. Okay, thank you. Councillor Zaman. I think you're on, still on mute. Sorry, I thought I turned that one off. I must have turned the other one off. Um, sorry. Um, it's a question on um, tackling inequalities. Uh, I was wanting to know um, in terms of some of the work that you've outlined, um, how how you're planning to embed that in, in, in your sort of, um, uh, well, across the sort of council's um, other action plans and um, what sort of investment are we looking at in terms of building capacity? Because as we know, you know, we can carry on doing this type of work forever and ever and unless we actually build skills and, and capacity or the sort of training skills with people and more so you know due to uh, the recent pandemic you know th there'll be a lot of people that will be out of work suffering from various other uh, health issues so um, how, how are we planning to engage with those sort of vulnerable communities and, and how we're trying to embed this across the board um, I mean Harpreet touched a little bit on um, in terms of embedding this work uh, across the various themes, but how are we planning on prioritizing some of that? And um, in terms of allocating resources, I mean, unless resources are, are, are there to ensure that this type of work is, um, is having an impact on communities and other partners are taking and sharing the responsibility. I mean, we, we seem to be quite good on um, writing the, um, writing uh, plans like this but in in reality how is it going to shape how is it going to look how is it going to work how are we going to measure the impact um and in terms of engaging you know we have to um ensure that we're not engaging with the usual suspects because again that's one of the criticisms that we seem to get on a regular basis that you know we seem to go to the same groups we go to the same individuals you know whenever we're trying to deliver some of this work and um and some of the learning that we've had throughout this pandemic how are we um, working to ensure that we maintain that and, and build that into some of the equalities work that we're planning on delivering? Thank you. Thank you. So who's coming in to answer that? Kate? Thank you. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's some, some really um, big, big questions there. Thank you. The, the first point that you asked was around how, how do we make sure that this, this work is um, is embedded and connected into other action plans, and I guess there's a um, there's, there's a couple of answers to that. Really, we we have within our um, structures uh, an integrated impact assessment, which started off life as an equality impact assessment that we did some further work on um, beginning of this year, end of last year. It's a bit of a blur. Um, 
to bring in some additional protected character or effectively protected characteristics. So to make sure that we're thinking about people with um, low income carers and also then to integrate our equalities impact assessment with our work around um, sustainability so thinking about environmental impact to bring that together and one, one of the things that, that we know that we we need to do as part of the um, inequalities action plan is to make sure that that really gets embedded within the organization that it is steering the development of our activity at an early stage that it's in it that it's informing our um, resource decisions and that it is understood and used across Across the organisation, rather than just in particular particular aspects of it. So we know that we know that we have a, a, a tool in in place that we can make work harder to make sure that all of our choices and, and, and all of our decisions and all of our investment decisions are focused on you know, take into account and are focus and indeed more than that are focused on addressing inequalities. So that, that that's part of what will help. I I am. Um, I could wear my, my policy badge um, and, and say that there, there is a further need to look at some of our key strategies and a commitment to look um, at our um, economic strategy and our health and wellbeing strategy in particular as sort of two key strategies in, in the context of the, both COVID but also our commitment to ra around tackling inequalities. So there, there is a piece of strategy work that we need to do. Uh, for, for me, I'd, I'd put the, the focus on the decision making and, and the, the use around around that tool as first and foremost, we, we, but we do need to do that strategy work as, as well to, to make sure that our um, overall approach is levering as, as much change as we, we possibly can. You, you raised a, a further a further point around um, engagement, and that that I think is is, is something that's really um, close to to a, a lot of people's hearts as, as we as we work on this in um, inequalities action plan. We we know that while we can learn the lessons from the current phase of our response to coronavirus and you know we've had some quite detailed conversations with our mutual aid groups about learning so far we've talked in quite a lot of detail to staff i know that there are also um councillor facing sessions um both taking place and, and being planned that we will feed in we know that if we're serious around tackling inequalities then we we need an ongoing conversation in part because that's about relationship building and that's an important part of addressing inequalities in itself and in part because that will inform further phases of, of the action plan you know it is it is by that that engagement and co-production that we can really kind of develop further actions that will really make a difference to people's lives and when rachel was on was answering the question around the the, the the how how do, how will we know that we've made a difference? One of the critical things for me that I would would want to make sure that we sit alongside those population level indicators, and measures that are meaningful to people, that people can experience and feel within their own lives and understand the the difference that's being made. So we we will. Um, roll out while we are developing an inequalities action plan to as i said on that flight path to an october discussion we, we know that that is not the end point that there will be a lot more work that we need to do on an ongoing basis you know you know ongoing with no end point really in terms of building those relationships and engaging and using that to feed into developing further phases of the plan because it's only by doing that that we'll do something that has has a you know a real and long-lasting impact for um, you know, people in Kirklees. You 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 asked another question around um, resources, the money. Can I can I ask Rachel to come in at, at, at that point in terms of kind of yes, yeah, how yes, how, how we see so. that in? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Rachel. Yeah. Yeah, um, thank you, Kate. Um, I think with regards to money, I guess there's a number of, of issues that you've raised there. The, there's the, the question of are we um, employing the right people who can work and understand and get involved in our communities so we get the right perspective so that we're not um, engaging with the usual suspects and we definitely need to be clear about our recruitment strategy in that. So there'll be a recruitment strategy that supports our inequalities action plan. I think there's also something for me about how we ensure that investment decisions are made um, bearing, you know, taking into account that. So one of the things I think um, is often um, an issue is that we we look at people's access to some of some of the services that we deliver and I, that could be us in the council or it could be the NHS or it could be multiple partners. 
and we try and and kind of shoehorn people into saying well you need to access this service because we've got it like this and and it's about you changing to get access to that actually what we really need to shift to if we're genuinely going to change things is how we co-produce a service and intervention with the people that are going to be potentially impacted the most. So how do we move away from a, from a standard service delivery pathway and move to something that is designed with the people in mind and that actually ends up with the resources behind tackling those people who are going to experience more um, inequality through some of the outcomes of that. So certainly um, councillors of man one of the things that it might be worth um, having a conversation with particularly through the health and social care panel that you chair is how we can put that inequality slant on some of that service delivery particularly because from a partnership perspective we've definitely got a partnership exec commitment around um, inequalities which is great um, but it's how we translate that into action which I think is going to be the key so that we don't just pay lip service to it. Um, equally, there's quite a lot of regional conversations about what we can do to um, impact on inequality. So there's some lessons that we can learn from there and also potentially some resources that we can tap into at that level that will help us ensure that we've got um, money into the right um, initiatives to help tackle those inequalities. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Upal, are you wishing to ask another question or are you still indicating from previously? Sorry, I did actually want to ask okay. a question, but I didn't realise my hand was up and I think Andrew put his hand up first. So Yeah, I, so, I don't mind, you, you go first. You go first. All right, Councilor sorry Upal. about yeah. that. I lower my hand now. <laughs> um, uh, thanks for that, Rachel. Actually, I think you've probably covered some of the things I was going to say. Um, I think that is interesting around access and I think part of it, I know there's there's more and more work being done around power inequalities. And I think it would be really good if we could reflect some of that because power inequalities, I think sometimes people think think about that at a national level about government or like, you know, really rich people having the power and no one else. But we know that exists at different levels and it could exist within a neighborhood. It could exist within workplaces, within schools. Um, it could exist, for example, with the relationship we have as a commissioner with those that are delivering. So I think part of the part of doing this is looking at um, some of those power relationships and saying at what point do we give up some of that power ourselves or do we ask our partners to give up some of that power and we we share that we share some of that decision making and power with with local groups and communities who perhaps understand some of those issues better on the ground and sometimes that means taking a risk um but i think as long as we can say we can't say now everything's going to work absolutely perfect but you know we have some confidence actually we're going to go into it and there might be some things we get wrong here but we've got to try and test some of that because i think those power inequalities really do exist everywhere. And perhaps we don't even understand we've done it ourselves. So I'd like a little bit of a, a think about that. And then the other thing was just around the, the local wealth building. I know CLES, one of the things they are pushing is around ownership models. So it is about looking at who owns what in, in local areas. Um, and I know that obviously we've been working with CLES, but I'm not sure we've moved um, forward on some of the stuff they're saying around ownership. And that's really us trying to understand who owns what in different areas and does that match up with the communities there? Um, you know, do we have disparity uh, within certain communities around ownership levels and could we do something to support that? So it's just a bit of a, just wondering if you, if those sort of things are on your radar. Uh, Rachel, did you want to come back on that? Okay. I think probably to, to say that they're on the radar, but whether that, that, you know, I think we've got to do a bit more work to understand what that means for Kirklees, I guess, because you're right, it's almost like people do associate particularly power inequality with with kind of a more national. So it's how we are. It's almost like what is the question we're trying to answer locally and therefore what would need to be in our action plan. But no, that that's helpful. I, th I think, again, um, I, as you as as things become more popular and I guess tackling inequalities in one sense has become a bit of, of a pop there'll be a popularity element of it and I guess the the important thing is to make sure we've got clear actions that we're confident will genuinely make a change here so um, we'll use whatever research is available to us to work out what's best for Kirklees so thanks for that. Councillor Cooper. Um, yeah so so um, I've I was kicked out of the meeting by my by my PC halfway through, but um, so I don't know if I've missed this. But um, 
um, are we are we clear that we've got the capacity to um, for, for all the opportunities that are going to come up? And the, the reason I ask that is is um, we're entering a time of uh, I think more funny money. Um, there's going to be more schemes, more more government throwing throwing cash at things um, uh, and and seeing who picks it up. Uh, and so it's going to be a time of opportunities. And you know I, I sort of regret in some ways that the my idea of an opportunities register wasn't taken up. Uh, by the council a few a few months ago, but there you go, and and so I, I look at this and I think the, the particular example would be the, um, the the green homes grant, two billion quid um, that's uh, been thrown at um, addressing um, insulation and renewables in in domestic houses and council homes actually. Now I've raised this uh, and put some ideas in uh, into the mix. But I, I sort of worried that, that perhaps this might have been um, taken as something that Wicker could do. Uh, and we could, oh, we'll give it to Wicker and Wicker will uh, will do it and they will do it on behalf of all five councils and we might get something. And that was that's my concern with it. Um, if we do it ourselves, we, we have more control, we have more ability to bring that money within to the, into the Kirklees economy. Uh, and, and do more things. So uh, I, I think there's, there's, uh, there's the sub-regional level, uh, I think, offers opportunities, but it also sometimes can be a place for us to send things when we haven't got the capacity to do it ourselves, if you see what I mean. Yeah, and, so, and there was, I think, and you were going to ask a question on the peer challenge and the investment in IC, ICT systems, because you've been thrown out. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been that would have if I'd have known I could have done. Um, there you go. If I know, I could have done. So so yeah. So it's it's about in many ways. My question is about are we are we are we clear that we've got enough um, opportunities to take advantage of funny money? How are we going to make opportunities that that we have transparent to members? Because I, I reckon if I had not raised the Green Homes Grant stuff, it would have been something dealt with officers quietly behind the scenes. Oh, should we do something about this? Well, maybe we'll, maybe we won't. And we would have never seen it. And so that whole idea about having opportunities up front uh, and, and opportunities and, and reasons for and for not going for them, I think is really important for this council. And um, it, it means that politicians are aware of choices that they could make. It put yeah. councils at the heart of the council. In fact, <laughs> can I uh, can I uh, add on to that as well? How is the corporate plan from Kirk Lees feeding into corporate plans in uh, across the West Yorkshire footprint? Uh, because, as Councillor Cooper has said, um, different uh, strands of strategy are dealt with in different areas. So, how does our corporate plan going to lend itself to the West Yorkshire's approach and vice versa, indeed? Kate? Thank you. I think just picking up on that last point first, in terms of input from Kirkley's shaping sub-regional activity. What, one of the things that we've been working on recently, as I, as I mentioned previously, is our economic recovery plan, which has been focused on what do we need to do in Kirklees to support business now and, and in the longer term, and to support a stronger economy, not just not just stronger businesses. And that, that work has directly shaped the West Yorkshire Economic Recovery Plan that's being led out by, by WICA. So the priorities within the Kirklees plan have been influencing and shaping then what, what, the, what that sub-regional plan does, just, just as that plan is also is also being shaped by, by the, the economic recovery plans for, for the other districts with, within West Yorkshire, um, although, although some of them haven't moved at quite the same, same pace as ours. So the, the, there are there are routes where you know as as an example of of where there are those routes where where we we think about what's what's necessary and what's what's the priority within Kirklees and there's decisions made at a, at a Kirklees level with with that member in, with that member lead as you say that that then shape that sub regional activity I think that that's quite quite a good example where where that that's working well I, I think in 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 terms of capacity. 
there's not a sing there's not a single answer to this it has it has to be about different approaches for, for different aspects so some, sometimes it, it is right that the that the council through through elected members and, and through the budget setting process makes decisions about where we put our resources that make the most difference some, sometimes as Rachel was highlighting it, it's it's about what we can do in partnership so partnership um e executive are, are you know a, 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 as have, have have set out a clear unifying mission beyond their you know, the current press, pressing mission of of, um, of save, saving lives from, from coronavirus to focus in on tackling inequalities and we'll come together around you know clear things that we can do effectively in 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 partnership because you know we live in a, a, a you know a complex world where obviously it's not just the council that can that can make a difference so sometimes it's that partnership footprint that we that we need to prioritize our um putting our capacity into and and and, and get getting those, that greater input sometimes it's a sub-regional sometimes that's as you say that's where the, the the resource can be and you know with the with devolution then that that will give us additional resource as well so i i guess it's the the we, we need to make sure that we're, we're drawing capacity from you know from all those places depending on what it is that we're trying to achieve yeah Rachel, did you want to come in at all or not? I think it's probably just to say um, in in the cap, in the corporate plan, um, what we need to be explicit about is our appetite for making the most of those opportunities, as Councillor Cooper said, and ensure that that then gets built in to how we deliver our services and how we ensure that that Kirklees gets its its share and more in terms of those opportunities. So we can certainly feed that into the plan. OK, thank you. Can I ask um, a question? Um, just when we're talking on um, communications, I can remember a conversation we had uh, with West Yorkshire Combined Authority when they came about actually councillors not seeing um, when their meetings were and not what was on their agendas. Um, you know, councillors in Kirklees get all the meeting notices for Kirklees, but we don't see meeting notices for the combined authority unless you go specifically and look. And therefore, uh, as Councillor Cooper said, it's not always apparent uh, what decisions are being taken uh, uh, as much as what's been taken in Kirklees. Uh, but that's a separate issue that we've already talked about. Um, but um, I want to ask about the plan itself. You're saying it'll be a short document supported by various materials. And it sounds a little bit as if the various materials are going to be uh, larger than the plan. Um, and I'm just wondering where the, uh, how you're going to uh, uh, give the ambition of the moving forward, uh, the resilience that we've talked about, the uh, tackling inequalities, etc., and not um, uh, giving um, a lot of information about performance, really, because a lot of the how you've done over the past year is actually how the council has performed, um, and we're not actually seeing uh, those reports coming through at the moment on performance uh, very much. So how are you going to get the balance between moving forward and looking backwards? I think that's I think that's a, a fair challenge and it's always the challenge isn't it when you're trying to do something brief so that it's accessible versus trying to do something detailed because we're you know we're accountable for delivery against the commitments that we that we've made um the what as I said one of the supporting documents will, will be that performance report that sets out how we um, are delivering against key key metrics against our sh shared outcomes um, as Rachel's alluded to previously, you know, some of those have quite a significant lag um, in terms of the data that they're based on. And so we, we will look to see what else we can provide that gives a more up to date um, picture. Because we know that obviously life will have changed considerably over the last five months. Yeah. So we will yeah. look to see what we can support that yeah. with. Yeah. But I, I think I think what I'm what I'm keen to do is, is to make sure that that effectively there are then a number of kind of bite sized kind of 
pieces of work to this. So if you're looking for the forward look, then you can go to one place. If you, you know, if you're looking, I'm not saying that these are sort of scattered across the internet before you start to worry about that. Yeah, but they're they're together in a batch. But if you're look if you're looking at the, you know, where are we going? Then you can look in one place. If you're looking at the well, what, what's up? What does our performance metrics tell us? You can you can look at a separate thing rather than expecting the whole suite of things to be of interest to everybody. And I mean, certainly, you know, taking advice from from communications team on this in terms of how we can ha- hang hang those things together. But you're right; yeah. it is, it is yeah. a balance to be achieved. It is. It is because some of the things in the last corporate plan will be relevant now. And some of them will need to change and adapt to the new world, won't they? As well as uh, the new that you wish to bring forward. Rachel, you wanted to come in. Yeah, it was just to say, I think, um, you know, it, what the real strong feeling we got from full council last year with the, the, with the plan was that there was general support for it. But I think it felt that um kind of using the staff's perspectives that the, the, it was a very strong push for us to use you know our citizens views and 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 generally to be able to articulate the difference that they've felt as a result of of what the council had been up to um so clearly the, there's a real opportunity with with what we've been through recently to be able to do that um but again you end up potentially with something that's fairly unwieldy and i think the opportunity the opportunity to bring the approach here to to the um management committee is to kind of get that sense from you about kind of how to 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 um, get that balance right and to just get that input so that when we we come back with the plan once once we've done that then it feels like we've, we've had that input and shaping really so it's really helpful to get those views and steers on that but I think as Kate said um, we want to do justice but then we don't want something that feels like a huge term especially given that you know we've got staff who are focusing on the future a little bit more now but then we've still got staff who are genuinely still in the middle of dealing with the pandemic and it's quite a a, a difference in terms of how people are um, as far as our staff is concerned and then obviously there's, there's our citizens as well and where they are in that space. Okay, thank you. And also, I'd like to ask about communications. So communications obviously are going to be ongoing, especially in the public health role. How are you going to keep those communications fresh? Because you're going to be giving the same messages, but you need to be giving them not just on social media, but across other methods as well. Um, But you also need to be giving them in a way that people um, uh, keep uh seeing them if you see what i mean there isn't message fatigue as it were i i think that's absolutely right i think we've 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 got to the stage now where there is already message fatigue out there and then there's a there's a few ways around that some of which we're already doing the first thing that you can do is change your messenger there's been a lot of government messaging there's been quite a lot of council messaging but we're I don't know if you've seen on our social media, we work with the CCG to get GPs to deliver some of the messages. So that's that's one way around it. Um, I think working with partners more widely uh, and tapping into some of the um, networks that they have um, is another way around it. But I think the, the key thing that's been happening over the last few weeks is since we've had the more detailed local data, um, and since we've had hundreds of staff out there on the streets talking to people and hearing their views, we're getting a much better insight into what the specific issues are, you know, down to the kind of level of people are aware of the advice, but they're, they're still not aware necessarily of how easily the virus transmits, for example. So you can really focus your messages onto those things that your insight tells you um is a gap and you can avoid repeating all those um messages before but i think it it's a combination of of things with there are new platforms we know that there's a younger cohort that's perhaps um affected more by the virus at the moment what what are the new platforms you can use and 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 um perhaps using influences that aren't associated with the council or, or the government or the previous messengers i think we need to think about all those all those things and we can test it as against the insight that we're getting every day um, from the field. Councillor Cooper, did you want to come in? Yeah, um, so uh, I think we've, we've talked about this previously. I just wonder whether we have an Instagram account yet as, as a council. 
We do. Yes. We do now. Yes. We, we, we do, but um, it's not heavily promoted because when you start a new platform on social media, it's um, not just an echo chamber, it's an empty um, echo chamber. Um, so we're building it up. Um, but um, I'm, I'm once just we... about to join you. I'm just about to follow you. Well, I'm going to be caught out in the most embarrassing of ways if it's not if it's not there. But no, it is I'm... there. Um, but we're, we're building a body of work. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, so you, you, so yes, thank you. Um, and can I ask as well about the partnership plan? Um, when that is going to be ready to be looked at as well? You've talked about the inequalities plan and um, etc. Um, but the partnership plan, when will that be ready? And um, will we be seeing communities as partners as well as uh, uh, CCGs etc? Yeah, I can come in on that if that's helpful. Um, so the, the partnership plan that that we that we've referred to is the piece of work that will that will deliver on partnership executives' commitment around you know, that unifying mission around tackling inequalities. So it it will be it will be the actions that the members of partnership executive agree to take together on that. So whilst obviously citizens are our partners, we're talk, we're talking about that commitment from from that particular sort of partnership network. Um, they they haven't as yet said a specific date as to when it will be done. My intent is to help that partnership group to deliver it pretty much alongside our council plan. Um, we we usually have, um, and um, I'm being slightly hesitant because I don't want to commit when it's the you know it's in the partnerships gift to do it. But we usually have um, a, a partnership um, event at the back end of the year, the Picture of Kirklees event that we've held over the last few well couple of years and in, in previous years before that as well. And my my sense is it would it would be um, productive to well, a to do to do an event of that nature in this year although obviously it's a virtual thing before my public health colleagues tell me that we can't possibly do that um, and that that would be a, a, a positive place for those partners to come together and articulate so that to the to the to a wider set of partners and a sort of that wider family of partners what they will be prioritizing and how they will be taking that forward which is a long rounded winded way long winded way of saying i think we're working to november for that just after our okay. council plan all right yeah i think scrutiny would like bit, to see them i think but it is in that, like that, that partnership plan. plan i'm sure uh, councillor cooper would like to see that corporate yes councillor cooper yeah of course yeah councillor um, Paul, yeah had a question oh sorry rachel did you want to oh, come I'm, in yeah i'm sorry i think it was just to acknowledge that um We've had this situation where we were having our regular battle rhythm of a partnership gold meeting while we we're in the pandemic. And then we kind of sort of dipped our toe into going to a partnership exec where we were then looking at um, kind of the longer term. And then we were straight back in on the back of local restrictions into that partnership gold. So to be fair, I think it's it's events that have meant that we haven't moved as fast as we want to. So it was just acknowledging that the partnership have been fabulous in the response. Uh, uh, and, you know, I know the commitment is there. It's just how we manage that immediate with the longer term. I understand. Councillor Rupal. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, sorry, I just wanted to come back on the, the communications um, point. I think um, yeah, there's been some really good stuff out there recently. Uh, so, so well done to the teams for that. There was also the uh, uh, mutual aid sort of private Facebook group that got set up by the council pretty early on. And I actually think that was really useful because it was a useful way of trying to uh, um, share messaging with local neighbourhoods and communities. And, you know, I, I was really glad that happened pretty quickly and it was it was shared amongst councils and, and local groups and more people joined. And I think that sort of thinking, is, is really good and it's a great way to connect with communities and we know Facebook out of all of them is, is well used by uh, the majority of the population perhaps not so much younger people and that's where Instagram and Snapchat and all that business comes in but you know Facebook for a, for a wide profile um, I think I'd like to see more of that type of stuff and I think just overall I think what we've learned over the last few months is how important that um, 
direct communication is and the you know the on the ground work as well so I would like to not forget that um because sometimes when we talk about communications we're just talking about um social media and things like that so how we put those two things together I think is really important just just to give an example in my ward we've had problems with um, legal gatherings and raves um and following those we have spoken to the police and, and Jill Greenfield and her team um and we were able to get some measures in place I think one of the things I would like to see more of is being able to sort of engage with the comms team a little bit more in terms of getting more stronger messaging out about why it's, you know, about saying how detrimental it is for people to to, to come together and have raves. And again, using, because, you know, as a council, I could go out and about two people would listen to me, but, you know, using those, you know, local DJs who say, <laughs> yeah, at least two people, Andrew, <laughs> would listen, but <laughs> using local, you know, when a, D, a local uh, well, DJ... Well, those people are councillors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> My two council colleagues would listen. But I know, for example, when a DJ put something up in our local area and said, I'm not attending this rave, it's wrong to do it, he's going to have much more credibility than I am or than a council office is going to have or even a GP. So I think just us being able to use some of those and being a little bit more nimble and following up with, with social media messaging on, on those particular points would, would be really good as well. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. I, th I think that's one of the, the learning points that we've had from from the pandemic that we'll we'll take on board how um new networks have sprung up people who weren't necessarily part of previous networks that we were familiar with and perhaps a bit were a bit stayed in in some ways have have emerged and we in in some cases we've grasped them um so yeah that definitely something that we'll we want to continue I think influences the government now are talking a lot about influences in terms of their strategy because of the message fatigue and and how do we how do we recreate that on a on a local level people who are genuinely credible um how do we seek them out how do we persuade them to to cooperate with us i think that that's all all, all stuff that we'll take on to a to a post covid com strategy okay thank you are there any more questions on this item no okay so uh, if I could recap some of the points then um, that we've mentioned. So we mentioned digital inclusion um, across all age groups. We, I think it's mentioned for children and young people, but I think across all age groups as well. Forever Kirklees, I think um, we quite like that changing. I think that needs to change. Um, uh, more prominence for resilience. We've discussed that. Uh, children and new people, employment opportunities as well as further education opportunities, health inequalities, front and uh, all inequalities front and centre. Okay. Um, those uh, wider projects, long-term projects, certainly on we discussed in relation uh, to climate change, didn't we? Um, clear and consistent messaging, uh, innovative messaging in the comms strategies. Uh, the budget strategy and partner involvement, talked about that. Wider engagement with people, not just the usual groups that we talk to, but wider engagement. Clear actions in relation to the uh, council plan. Uh, inclusive economy, talked about inclusive economy um, and partnerships uh, build on the approach that you've, you've taken over the last uh, few months. Is there anything that I've missed that the panel feel ought to be uh, in that summary? No? OK, that's good. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for uh, attending the meeting uh, this afternoon. Uh, if the panel uh, wish to now move on to the work programme, please. Officers who are not involved in this, who wish to leave, please feel free to do so. Thank you. OK, so uh, the work programme then at pages 33 uh, to 54 of the papers. 
Um, we've got um, an informal uh, scrutiny uh, management committee meeting, as I have mentioned, in September. And then we'll have the crime and disorder meeting on, in the end of October. OK. Um, corporate scrutiny panel. Councillor Cooper, do you want to say anything on, on the work programme for the co corporate scrutiny panel? Uh, it's been mentioned enough in the meeting. I'm, I'm happy to pass on that. OK, thank you. And uh, health and adult social care, Councillor Zaman. Do you wish to say anything on yours, Councillor Zaman? Uh, no, it's uh, the information is there. OK, thank you. Economy and neighbourhoods, Councillor Opal. Um, yeah. Do you want to say anything on yours? I think you had a... Um, uh, a place uh, strategy meeting did you today we had that's the working group yes so we had a place yeah. based working um work meeting <laughs> sorry i can't yeah. get my words out today <laughs> we, uh, a meeting this morning um they gave us an update on the place-based approach during covid um and we're sort of reassessing our priorities in terms of what we want to focus on which will include doing having a bit more of a detailed look on the place partnerships um hopefully get the uh, place leads uh, to a meeting so we can uh, discuss how they found the approach looking at um geographical identity and then also around um, the uh, relationship with the vcs sector in terms of place-based working so we'll be focusing on on those things okay thank you councillor marchington on the children's scrutiny work program do you want to say anything no i don't think there's anything to add it's not been mentioned in the meeting already. OK, thank you very much. Um, and any items uh, that you think we ought to discuss on the management committee level, do let me know. Um, I'm keeping keeping that work programme uh, fluid at the minute to be able to respond uh, to any changing circumstances in Kirklees. Um, so um, under any other business, I've got an update on an emergency decision. Um, I agreed that an urgent item in relation to the purchase of the George Hotel could go to Cabinet on the 16th of June. Um, it was agreed that the item would be exempt from calling, but on the proviso that relevant information be taken to the Economy and Neighbourhood Scrutiny Panel at the earliest opportunity. And that was considered on the 9th of July, I believe, Councillor Opal, you had that information, we did. did you? We That's did, good. Yeah. Yes, OK. Thank you very much. Is there anything else that any of the panel members wish to raise at this moment in time? No, thank you. No, OK. Uh, right then, so um, the date of the next meetings, there's an informal on the 29th of September. The formal is on the 29th of October. So thank you very much, everybody, uh, for attending today. Please stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.